Well, um, I'm going to say hello first. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Joe Martinez. I'm one of the hosts of uh, Refractive Light. And uh, with me tonight is the ever beautiful and super smart uh, Brother Briggs Cunningham. Um, and uh, I know Randy loves to talk, so I'm going to give him his minute or two to speak uh, before Brother Briggs gets started. And uh, Brother Randy, I know you love starting with an invocation, so uh, I am going to mute everybody but Brother Randy and Brother Briggs, and we will get rocking and rolling. For those on um, Facebook, uh, if you have any questions for Brother Briggs, uh, just go ahead and put them in the chat box. We're watching that, and we will make sure your questions get answered. Um, and with that, I will defer to Brother Randy. Thank you, Brother Joe. Um, all right, if everybody would uh, uh, please uh, assume a um, respectful posture towards uh, prayer and deity. Most holy and glorious Lord God, the great architect of the universe, the giver of all good gifts and graces, in thy name we have assembled, and in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Grant that the sublime principles of Freemasonry should so subdue every discordant passion within us, so harmonize and enrich our hearts with thine own love and goodness, that the meeting at this time may humbly reflect that order and beauty which reign forever before thy throne. Amen. Uh, thank you, Brother Joe. Uh, thank you, folks. Um, Brother Joe asked if uh, he might work with me on, on a uh, Wednesday night session for um, the Joint Masonic Education. Uh, and, and I um, enthusiastically agreed. Uh, Brother Briggs is, is a uh, um, highly recommended and a wonderful speaker, and I look forward to this presentation tonight. Brother Joe? Absolutely. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Brother Briggs, um, uh, I don't like reading people's Masonic resumes because I don't know what they like and what they don't like, so I will uh, let you introduce yourself, and I will shut up now. So go ahead, sir. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I hope everybody's doing great this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the presentation is about an hour long. Uh, at the end, we'll do a live presentation. Again, my name is Briggs Cunningham. Uh, I'm from Arizona. Uh, my Blue Lodge is Saguaro 45 in Phoenix, Arizona. And tonight we'll be talking about alchemy, uh, which brought me to Freemasonry. Uh, it's been a subject I've been interested in since I was about 15 years old from a library left over from my grandfather. Uh, I am now 47 years old. Uh, so reading those testimonies of those alchemists and learning the symbols and their processes, you can imagine uh, my first entrance into the Blue Lodge and recognizing those symbols and my mind being blown. It was, uh, I'll never forget that experience. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, normally this would be class number three on what I call practical alchemy. Uh, I can do the other two classes uh, for any of your other groups. Uh, if you're interested, they take about the same amount of time and we can talk about those later. Um, this one tonight is the marrying of the two. The first class is on the spiritual aspects of alchemy. The second class is on the material aspects of alchemy and how we marry them. And Joe, um, I forgot to check, can everybody hear me okay? Hey, you sound great. Wonderful. Okay, and then my goal tonight is I'm going to be looking down here. I'm going to be using a PowerPoint, and then we'll do a, a live presentation at the very end. Um, I'm going to be reading my notes so I don't take us down a rabbit hole. My goal is to introduce you uh, to a rabbit hole, basically. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my desktop here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Wonderful. So many have heard about the um, mysteries of alchemy, sometimes through Vedic lore, uh, sometimes studying the Kabbalah, uh, Rosicrucianism. Um, today what I want to do is show you guys practical alchemy, what, a, what an alchemist looks like today, and what kind of work that they do, what kind of works are they continuing uh, to do, uh, and how valuable they are. Now, when most people think of an alchemist, I think they picture Dave here. And I really want to make you guys laugh to kind of pick up the vibe a little bit. <laughs> when I first saw this picture, I, I think I laughed for about 15 minutes. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> 
But what I want to do is I want to give you, you know, some real science today. I put together some videos um, that were done in the lab um, by some uh, anonymous folks on YouTube and some safe areas. And then more importantly, some locations that you can visit today uh, and also printed uh, uh, scripts and, and those type of things too that you can get your hands on. And interestingly enough, we have a wonderful one, a place preserved right here in the United States and Pennsylvania, and I'm gonna uh, share that with you today. So alchemy is an initiatic um, type of thing because you are studying the book of life, so you're watching nature. So by watching nature, you're, you're understanding uh, how the spirit of God works, and, and so you can rise through realizations. Uh, here's a great example of, a, of an image um, created of that idea. Um, it's a natural ceremony or a series of actions or events that edu educates an alchemist in marrying his physical and spiritual natures into one. Here we see an act or a drama or, a, or starting something or the beginning of something. Alchemists are, are uniquely self-starters. So let's look at this image for a second. What, what do you guys see here? We can see, I've got a list, seven pillars of humanity. We've got the four elements, the planets, the signs, the stages, um, listed as laboratory processes, but, but veiled there are the, are the liberal arts. Uh, I can see a skull in there. I can see the chemical wedding in the very center happening. Um, those interested in tarot, the tower, uh, the gentleman on the bottom right is hoodwinked. Uh, we've got a, entering a rabbit hole. And also the mysterious um, 369 is also in this image. I've seen this come up quite a bit. Let's take a look at it here. So modern day alchemists like Nikola Tesla. We're using all of his ideas right now while we're doing this. A lot of this technology comes from his alchemical mind. When he was a young man, his Orthodox father had passed away and he moved to Prague uh, where he studied the alchemical testimonies in the books and, and really uh, allowed his mind to be able to see things uh, in nature that normally you wouldn't be able to see. This image I have behind me is uh, where that kind of started with King Rudolph in Prague, and we'll talk about him a little bit later. So again, the first class that I teach is on the spiritual side of alchemy, the mystery school connections, and I created a key here on the left that we, uh, we just bring in the images one by one and rise to the top as we discuss it. On the right, the second class is uh, the chemistry. We start early in Egypt. I'm talking 300,000 years ago, possibly, when a meteor hit. And then we move into the uh, pharaoh uh, Tuharka, who ruled northern and um, lower and upper Egypt. I found an incredible story on him. He's located in the Old Testament, coming to save the temple. Uh, and then what I do is I show you the chemistry from around the world. What were they doing in Egypt? What were they doing in Europe, in the Middle East, in India? And, and what did they think the Philosopher's Stone was in the material world? So these are things that I've, I've worked on um, since I was about 15 years old and, and collecting to share with you all today. So this is a place that you can visit in Pennsylvania. It's called uh, Old Economy. <clears throat> My relatives built this. They built three cities throughout America and created a lot of the Industrial Revolution. This city here was built in 1824. They were bone Rosicrucians from, from Germany and brought with them some very important alchemical texts that may possibly have once belonged to uh, Dr. D, uh, uh, St. Germain, and a few others. Here you can see on the Google 3D map, um, to the left is the Great House. In the center, we have a fountain uh, of Sophia. And this would be an alchemical garden. You, you would have seven different paths going, teaching the seven different liberal arts. Uh, the little house on the left with the little silver roof was the alchemical lab. We'll discuss that a little bit later, but you would be taught gardening. Um, to the top right is the grotto. That's where the alchemists would pray uh, and, 
ask God for help. Now, this is where I went. Uh, I was allowed in there. The, unfortunately, the alchemical symbols in there have been painted over. Uh, someday, maybe we can restore that. I don't know. Uh, the building in the bottom left, I believe at one time, was the largest freestanding roof. It's where they ate. And when I walked into it for the first time, it felt like a lodge, like an early lodge. And there's a, a huge Masonic connection here in the 1800s that we can talk about later as well. So alchemists always start like we did today, and that's by invoking the spirit of God for help. A little bit different than what some people do in science today. I'm not saying all. I know scientists that, that do pray to God before they start their, their work. This spirit has also been called the Spiritus Mundi, the Aton, the Holy Spirit. And where you can see this happening is usually when polarities click together. A great example of this is camping. We have a wonderful sunrise and sunset here in Arizona. And if you're camping and you're in a clear area like this and that sun starts rising, as soon as that light hits nature, life explodes. If you're in the moment, your mind is not in the past, it's not in the future, and you're really focusing, it's beautiful and it hits you, it hits you right in the soul. And the birds are talking, the animals are coming out, and you can see this at sunset as well because there's a whole bunch of other creatures that live at night. So as soon as that sun drops, you can kind of feel that, that click. I think that's a good place that we can locate that. And that's, that's one of the places the alchemists describe of looking. So let's talk about the plant kingdom real quick before we get into the mineral and metal kingdom. We have to separate the gross from the pure. And we have to do that gently and we have to do that with judgment and patience. Um, this is a very popular medicine today. This is cannabis. Uh, this is an indica grown down in Tucson by a brother who has a state licensed uh, indoor uh, grow. Um, this is a mixture of what they call Larry OG and Granddaddy Purple. So even today we're creating symbols based on on our own ideas and somebody 200 years from now is going to be like, who is Larry? What does OG mean? Um, so these are things that are going to be looking up. Um, now, most of us have smelled marijuana when the plant is dead, when it has no life. Now, when you walk into a room like this, it's like a bouquet. This plant here smells like grape candy, uh, smells like blueberry muffins and Kool-Aid mixed together. It's a, it's a beautiful smell. Um, I think the only thing I've smelled that doesn't smell as good as that is probably popcorn, butter popcorn at the movie theater. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful smell. Now, as alchemists, we looked at this and we're like, look at that crystal structure growing on there. What is that and why is it doing that? And then the, and that's where the medicine is. Okay, well, how do we as alchemists replicate nature and make it grow faster? And if you look close, I mean, they're, they're growing towards the light. And we realized it's, it's a sunblock for that plant. And so we had to adjust the light to try to create, to, to, to make it create more sunblock. And we were very successful uh, at that here. Now, one way we can um, extract the gross from the pure is through a distiller. Now, this is a very old one. This is one I had made in Spain at a copper. If we were to use this, it would take forever. The amount we would get would not be very good. And we'd have to Put it through many more processes to get that pure oil to separate it so we pray to god and we say hey show me something and lo and behold you start building a new device with technology today and instead of calcining it we're going to use ice and we're actually going to freeze it to get that oil off of that plant and look how beautiful and pure that is and we're going to move over to the other part of the operation here and we were successful at it, very successful. So again, this is practical alchemy of today. They would have been doing the same thing. Um, their distiller a long time ago may have been made with uh, clay, possibly in India. So the oil is poured out. The blackening that you see there is the photograph. It actually looks like pure gold, which is interesting. Again, this is how they would have described it. And then we throw it in an oven. We calcinate it one more time with heat. And then we have the product on the right, the crystal form. We've separated it. 
uh, we've turned a weed into a, about a $5,000 product. So that's practical alchemy of today. You know, if you were to take a piece of steel, which is not worth very much and turn it into clock springs, again, those processes, now you have some very um, uh, valuable steel. So again, this is just another example here. Now this is an example of a practical text uh, from Egypt. Most of the alchemical texts we look at are, are Baroque and beautiful, like the one behind me here. Uh, this one is called the Lead in 10 Codex. We think it was written about 250 AD. Uh, it was sold to the Leiden University in the Netherlands by a man calling himself the Swedish Vice Council in Alexandria in the 1800s. So this came from a private library. A lot of writings um, still exist in private libraries and, and aren't public. But this was found in Thebes. It was found with the Stockholm and magic texts that talked about the sun and Venus and perfumes and invocations. It also talked about gold alloys, which we're going to show today. Um, electroplating, which we're going to show today. So how did they electroplate? That's interesting. Purifying metals, testing them. They knew how to dye gems. Uh, St. Germain, we know, did this um, for royalty. Uh, remove scratches. They knew how to create paste jewelry and gold leaf writing techniques. We even have laws in here that are similar to the Mosaic laws. Uh, makeup is another one that we have. And most importantly, glass. Uh, working with glass um, was a held trade secret and very important, especially when working with uh, mercury and uh, heavy acids. So mercury to gold, is it possible? Absolutely, it's happened many times. Uh, sometime go back and watch the video and just read this little article here. This was a group of gentlemen uh, at Harvard University not too long ago, and this was, this was their experiment and what they worked on. Ayurvedic medicine is another aspect of alchemy that we touched on in the previous classes. Uh, part of this one is also a little bit of review, but a little deeper discussion. The image on the left um, really describes what's going on in the bottom, in the bottle on the right. This is use of mercury. What you see in that bottle are the oxides, the red, the blue, the black, and, and um, at some point there's going to be white. So minerals and metals were used as medicines. Um, way before Paracelsus in the 1400s. He brings that into uh, uh, the medical field. We don't know how long these guys have been using them. Um, my guess is it probably goes back to where we, when we came out of, of Egypt and they were uh, burying bodies because they knew how to preserve bodies and that is an intense alchemical process. Now this is one of the most um, famous pictures today, the green lion eating the sun. Isaac Newton was trying to decipher this. He would lock himself up in the boiling mercury and tasting it and smelling it and poisoning himself, actually. Um, what do you see in this image? Uh, you know, what I see is a green lion. He's sitting on his tail. I don't know why he's sitting on his tail. I've never figured that out, but he's biting into a gold sun and it's bleeding. Um, but it's not a liquid, it's a, it, the way it's hitting the ground, it almost looks like it's a powder because it's not turning into a pool and then we have some script here at the top. Now, when we look at these images, we can't say that it, it means this certain thing because you have to know your alchemist and you have to know what work they're working on. In this case, what they're talking about is aqua uh, fortis, which is called strong water, which is nitric acid which is an old, old acid uh, that, that we have, we've been using for, for thousands of years. Here's a red lion. A lot of you have heard of the red lion. Again, what is, what is he doing? He's holding this uh, gold cup. Is this an old pharmacy in Prague? Is he holding the secret to potable gold, drinkable gold, which was reducing gold and breaking the molecules into atoms so you can drink it so it's digestible? Uh, is this an acid again? So if we're, so if we're talking about an acid, you know, now we're talking about what they call the low called aqua regis. And that's going to be called king's water because it can dissolve gold. And that's a mixture of nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. There's a couple other ways you can make it as well. Now let's take a look at this picture. 
We've got a red gas and we have a green gas. We can easily describe this as two lions because these are two very, very dangerous gases and they're warring against each other. So I might draw an image of a red lion and a green lion going to war, telling the alchemists when they start going to war to back up, to get away from this and uh, be aware of the vapors. This is just the creation of nitric acid right here. This could be a, a book of images this thick, just, just to make this right here. And again, this shows the importance of glass. Okay, now let's watch two different uh, paths of one of the most coveted secrets hidden in images, allegorically stories and symbols, the reduction of gold for use in medicinal and other purposes. Uh, we can't digest gold uh, when it's in its metal form because it's one of the most densest things on the planet. So our stomachs, the hydrochloric acid won't, won't dissolve. And I want to do a warning here on any of this stuff. This is buyer beware stuff. You know, don't, don't drink this. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a chemist. Um, I'm just showing you this stuff. And just think about how it impacts you spiritually is how I want you to look at this. So here we have some pure gold. We're going to add some nitric acid. And this is what they would have done down in their lab. And see how this strikes your soul. This is really cool. Now we're going to add the nitric acid. We're creating uh, the king's water, the aqua regia. Now we're applying heat. We're applying a steady heat. Sometimes they would describe that as a, a bird uh, laying on its eggs. We have to create steady heat. Now what you're watching is this pure gold. Uh, the molecule the molecules are being broken up. And you'll literally start seeing them dissolve from the coin. Now, we're not losing any of the gold. It's just basically being broken up and disappearing in our liquid here. World War II, the Nazis knocked on a Nobel Peace Prize winner's door. He knew they were coming, so he did this with his gold medallion. And when they came in, he told them it was apple cider vinegar. So he was able to keep it. And I'll show you how to get the gold back here in a second. So let's watch. That music too loud, Joe? Thank you. Well, that's good. So when you see a king in a bath and he's being dissolved, might be what they're trying to record for themselves. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, now we got to get rid of the acid. There's a few ways that, that we can approach this. One way is we're going to put it in this bag with some salt to extract the acid. Now we're left with a waxy film. This is the gold coin. It's just in a different state. So the alchemist would carry it like this uh, so nobody would steal it. Metabisulfate, they would have to figure out how to come up with something like this. Now, if we're following a, uh, if we're following one of these writings, we're looking for the symbol of gold here. We have our ring and then our dot in the middle right here, boom. Now we're looking for the pelican feeding its young, the sacrifice of the gold. That, we have a beautiful degree in the Scottish Rite of this. And there are the chicks at the bottom. Isn't that beautiful? It's gold, we're just playing with gold. Now we have our colors, red, black, white, yellow. Again, you have to make sure you're following them. You see this red powder? That's gold. So a lot of the texts, they're talking about red powder, uh, Nicholas Flamel. Now we have to clean it. Now some of them would carry it, and let's say we wanted to impress Queen Elizabeth. We might put that um, in a cup with any other metal or a bone. And, and say, this is the Philosopher's Stone Queen. Now, when I sprinkle this on it and hit it with heat of saltpeter or some type of high heat, and, and would put on a huge performance. And that heat will dissolve anything you put in there but the gold. So let's watch and see how this would have looked. 
Yeah, that red powder is a medicine uh, as well, I'll tell you. Because you can digest it, but obviously you can't have any of the acid on there. That wouldn't be good. There's our gold. Isn't that beautiful? And that's pure alchemist gold. Nine, 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 nine. Now in India, where they're originally getting the coda from, um, they were only using nitric acid and they had access to mercury. So here's another path. Now we're using mercury. This is a quicker path. Here's a chemical wedding. Uh, this is two opposites coming together. When you watch two opposites coming together, it can also be a description of a philosopher's stone. Here we have the male and the female. Here we have in Genesis, the spirit of God entering the waters on the planet. And it's rejuvenating the mercury. Isn't that cool? So we've got it sped up just a little bit here. So what we're doing is we're making an amalgam. We're solidifying the mercury to make it into a solid here. And if they didn't have gold, uh, well, no, that's a different process because here we're, we're actually working with gold. But they use amalgams for other things as well. Now these leaf gold, uh, you can get at restaurant supply stores. This is the stuff they put on cakes. It's very cheap because it weighs nothing. Um, it's so light that it can fly off your finger. So here's our little amalgam here. Now this is something uh, Isaac Newton would have been working on because when I look at his work, I know he had access to the crystal cinnabar path because he was getting crystal cinnabar, uh, so he would have had access to mercury. And when he was dead, they described finding mercury in his hair, which is interesting. So here's one of the secrets. A lot of people get lost here because the stone is still bleeding mercury. So we want to take a cloth and we want to really squeeze out the excess mercury so we can get a solid stone here. Now remember that green lion eating the sun we looked at earlier? I'm about to show it to you and what they were describing. We're gonna drop it into nitric acid into the green lion. And then we're gonna watch it turn into a sun and bleed. And it's gonna bleed red oxide and leave us the red uh, gold at the bottom. So Templars would carry their gold like this. Sometimes they'd put it around their neck. It was a great way they could move their gold or they would uh, reduce it to the red powder. Freaking genius and kept it secret. Here we go. Isn't that cool? Now again, the poor guy, he would have been looking over it, blinding himself. You know, the, the, the red oxide. You know, there's a story of him working in his lab and coming out a little mad because that red oxide will make you mad. It's used as a hallucinogenic in some ways. Uh, and then they created like the secret, I don't know, which, which is what, MI6 today or something like that. I think they created the Queen's uh, secret security. Okay guys, so here we are, we're pouring out the acid. There's our red powder again. Different process, so again, when we're looking at these colors and these testimonies, we need to know the alchemists. What did they have access to? Uh, what are they doing? What are they, what are they trying to accomplish? Here's some more of those images, a little bit different. One might be on potassium nitrate. One might be on ammonium, beautiful images. And again, they were hiding their work uh, the church didn't like it. They thought it was magic. You just weren't allowed to dig into nature. Uh, and then also hiding it from, from people from taking their ideas as well. Um, they really didn't, they didn't have trademarks and stuff like that back in those days. Um, we're going to look at another work here. This is by Steve Kalick. He's a master alchemist. He does beautiful work on Vimeo. You can look at a lot of his reworks as well. We're going to quickly look at this video. Now, again, he's used um, aqua regia and he's reduced the gold down to its liquid form. Okay, so now what he's doing is he's adding an oil. 
It's a specific type of oil. Look at those two colors again. Now we're creating a medicine, not nitric acid, but we have the same, it's the same two colors. What's so cool about this is the oil is gonna draw those particles of gold up to itself, separating it from the acid for you. It's a beautiful process. And this is really the only way, the powder, I don't know how they did it, but I'd be tempted to try this one. So here obviously we have a laboratory separator. Um, we're gonna drain out, he's gonna drain out the uh, excess acid. He's gonna have his gold left. He's gonna add it to some wine that he prepared alchemically. Uh, and then we'll see his final work here. And again, I highly recommend looking at uh, his work on Vimeo if you're interested in this type of stuff. And he's very approachable online as well. And there you have it. This is something the royal families and kings wanted because they could live to 80 or 90 years old. It cleans bacteria out of your body. That's what usually killed you back then, usually your mouth. Um, and so they could live as long as three generations. You know, people lived to 30, 40 years, and these guys were living to 80. So it was really important to them. Okay, let's look at a uh, gold plating here. We're going to use a, uh, an Apple Watch. Now, we won't talk about any of the symbols or anything. I want you guys to kind of look at it and see, you know, what kind of symbology would you give it? Now, the electroplating process they would have used was a zinc plate. Zinc, until Paracelsus' time, was what you kept secret. You never talked about it. It was collected in the Athenor from burning wheat, animals, uh, milk, and it was a little crystal, and they didn't know what it was, but it was magical to them. And then you have a plate of copper, and then possibly some zinc, or I'm sorry, some uh, hemp, material dipped in salt water. When you put those three together, you can create an electric charge with copper wires and can create a, can create a, some voltage. It's beautiful, Baghdad battery, Baghdad battery you could look up. Hydrochloric acid. So we're using stainless steel here, so we, which would be really hard to plate. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw something intermediate in there. We're gonna um, coat it with nickel first. So again, you have to imagine them doing this secretly, everyday hiding, thinking about this stuff, writing it down. Uh, Dr. D would have a couple different diaries. He would leave a couple of them out as fakes. So the negative is there on the post on the watch. Okay, so now we're gonna nickelize it here. And they were doing this in Egypt, it's pretty cool. So gold, so three things important to alchemists, gold, because you can do stuff with it, health, and immortality. And that immortality has, has a couple different philosophical ideas on what that means. So here we have our hydrochloric acid, again, Guys, we're gonna make our aqua regia because we're gonna reduce this gold down again for another process. There's our nitric acid. Now this time we're gonna boil it all the way down. We're gonna go from red to black. And instead of stopping where we did before to extract the gold or to extract the nitric acid to make the wax, again, this time in this process, the alchemist would have written out a process of boiling, boiling this down um, completely to a black state. Yeah, we're going to add a white powder to it here. We're going to mix it. So there's our whitening. 
black, red, and white are the most popular colors, but it just seems like nature, when you reduce it and bring it back together again, those three colors are always involved. It's, it's really interesting. Gold salt could be something else, could be mislabeled as a beautiful blue color, the color of Krishna. We're gonna add our gold. We're gonna mix it. We're gonna add our positive and our negative. And then you're gonna see the watch come out gold. We have another blackening. So again, they, these would be markers for them that they know that they're on the right process. Because they didn't know what to expect. They were working one step at a time. They would work and work and work and go, oh shit, it's black. Yes, now I can go to the next step. And then they would copy that and then get to the next one and the next one. Now let's see how they do it today. How do they turn mercury to gold today? Let's watch. And let me know if the volume is uh, good enough for you guys. So this will be the center of our path, but this is how we do it today. In the 1930s, less poetically, we call them particle accelerators in breeder reactors nowadays. And instead of lead, mercury is often used as a suitable starting element. Mercury 196 can capture a moderated slow neutron produced in a nuclear reactor, which yields mercury 197. This mercury isotope is unstable and decays to gold 197 by an electron capture process. Since mercury 196 with 0.15% is the least common mercury isotope, it seems natural to search for a procedure to convert the other mercury isotopes to gold too. At this point, the particle accelerator comes into play. Particle accelerators can produce high energy neutrons, which allow it to eject neutrons from the nuclei of higher isotopes of mercury to produce mercury 197. Nuclear physicists have shown many more routes to produce gold, but what they all have in common are the enormous production costs relative to the value of the produced gold. To give an example, in 1980, one billionth of cents worth of gold was produced by use of a particle accelerator in Berkeley at a cost of $10,000. So they could make it. I mean, it's a little different today. It was excruciating and they'd get a tiny bit. I mean, if you make $20 an hour today and you work eight hours and you go turn that in for some gold or you save it, you're making more than they did. So it w wasn't that much. But back then, you know, gold was scarce. Usually the kings had it and stuff like that. So let's, uh, we've got a little bit more here to go and then I'm going to do a uh, process for you. Let's take a look at this painting. This is one of my favorite paintings of alchemy. This is a moment in time, especially for us Freemasons. Possibly you're a Rosicrucian, uh, possibly a um, Royal Arch. In this image, we can see alchemy. We can see Rosicrucianism happening. We can see the Royal Arch. We can see the Blue Lodge. We can also see the origins of Shakespeare or the, the act of spear shaking which was an alchemical psychological plan to educate England and its surroundings with the seven liberal arts. And they did it through theater. So here on the bottom right is probably Edward Kelly. He may be looking at the 1609 opera of Paracelsus. The gentleman doing one of the experiments that we just showed is Dr. John D, mathematician, astronomer. Behind him in the red is possibly Francis Bacon. Um, next to the queen is probably his father, Nicholas Bacon. And Francis is watching this, these performances since he was a kid and getting ideas. And, and if you look at the image at the top left, this is an x-ray of the original. Um, when somebody bought it, they, it was too dark for them. So they had the skulls that Dee had surrounding him during this process, the human skulls. Also, there's some acid and some retorts at the bottom right hand corner. So they would put on uh, a Shakespearean play, usually, uh, and everybody would gather around. I went, I, I wanted to find this room. It doesn't exist anymore. I don't even think the queen where she was at the time might not. Now, when these two gentlemen, they were so smart, they knew how nitric acid worked, they went to Prague, and one of the things they were doing is collecting Moldavite, which you can see at the top right. Prague was hit with a meteor, just like Egypt. So it left this stone. It hit the ground and, and, and crystallized everything. Well, there's precious metals in there, so they could drop that into nitric acid or, and, and usually possibly remove some precious metals.
from here is, is brilliant. Uh, this is an image uh, by John D. we talked about with uh, uh, Peter Dawkins on Unknown Philosophers. If you haven't seen that interview, I, I highly recommend it as Freemasons. Uh, this is John, D., John D.'s navigation book. Uh, boy, what he described to us in the bottom right was uh, the, th the, the guys in the boat are basically the three degrees of masonry, of operative masonry. The royal arch being the ship, the nave. And then the uh, Kairos at the top being the Rose Cross, because that Rose Cross has been around. The Ross and the Crows have been symbol, the cross have been symbols forever. So they're showing something here. They're showing a plan. So I highly recommend going back and checking that um, interview out. But I wanted to show that image because this is there's some things hidden in there too, alchemically, which is which is really cool. Okay. All right. Around the same time. Uh, in London, a little bit earlier, you know, John Dee's probably about 15 years old around this time. Uh, let me find out where I'm at here, guys. Let's see. This is the Ripley Scroll. So this is something they would have looked at. This would have been around the time of Paracelsus and Agrippa. Beautiful scroll. There's about three or four of them available today. Again, this is something if you look up online, you can go see for yourself. It's beautiful. It's huge. This is one of the processes hidden in it that we'll do today. They were taking a redstone, copper, turning it into silver, and then into gold. And we will show you that process today. Another place they were, uh, were in Prague. And again, this painting behind me is King Rudolph. This is an alchemical lab that was found in 2002. Um, I've known about it. I've read about this in The Chemical Wedding. Anybody that have read that, you know, he takes this tunnel and he finds this alchemical lab and, and he is describing it as you see right here. There were tunnels that went to many different places underground. And this is where a lot of those things were happening uh, because this was production, this was industry. Uh, they had a secret passageway to the trade routes. Um, so this is where the king had his secret industry happening. Um, anything from silk production to glass to, uh, again, gold plating and stuff like that. And you can go visit this again today. And because of the 30-year war, when the Catholic Church came in, they sealed it up and it was frozen in time. It's incredible. Yeah. Even the handwriting notes. It, it, yeah, it's, it's really cool. And it's cool, it has like the classic secret like bookcase that moves and takes you down. So here's a map of the current city of Prague today. Top left, you have King Rudolph's beautiful castle. The bottom left, you had Edward Kelly's house. Uh, uh, Vincent Bridges, God bless him, he's not with us anymore. Did an amazing job the past 15 years recovering Edward Kelly's life history. He was a rock star, a lot of things said about him. Uh, weren't true, uh, and, and many great things were. Over to the right, the Jewish Quarter is where this alchemical lab was hidden under a very famous house of a very famous rabbi in its time. The top left photo is Edward Kelly's tower. This is where uh, he would do um, astrology and magic, basically. Uh, that really inspired um, Thelema and the... Uh, and the, and the Golden Dawn uh, with the um, Abramelin text. So anyways, this is his house. Bottom left is the castle with the cathedral. Top left, uh, it was a row they called, uh, I think it was called Golden Lane. You can see it in the bottom right. And this is where they sold the products and they, would, they wouldn't show you how they made them, but this is where they would sell them. Again, you can visit these places today. The top right is the old house. And uh, that alchemy is in the basement of that house. There was, the, again, in 2002, I believe there was a flood that cracked it open. They went, oh, what is that down there? And they found it. So who knows what's available underneath Prague. And again, these are places uh, you'll be able to go visit today. And it, it's perfect, uh, maybe next year, um, but they're all ready for you. Uh, all of them are set up and ready for you. A couple more. This is Germany, Rosicrucians working on their freedom as well. This is Heidelberg Castle, which was under uh, Frederick V of Palatine. A uh, good friend of mine, God bless him, in the 90s did a movie, uh, Terrence McKenna, The Alchemical Dream. Highly recommend watching that. Again, a history, uh, uh, really good history is in that one. 
Um, young king and queen allowed these men to have the freedom of the sciences and the freedom to worship as they want in this place. This is where they met. This is where the circle met. And they built an uh, alchemical lab below. Again, chemistry just, just travels with us as humans. It always has since the beginning of time. So, uh, but they, they took it a little bit more seriously. Uh, so here's the castle here. This is Terence going into it in the 90s before it was a museum. Uh, this is what it looks like today. So you can imagine Francis Bacon, these Rosicrucian brothers meeting here. I can imagine Michael Meyer visiting here. Uh, Rene Descartes, uh, the 30 year war when the Catholic Church is marching up to this castle to take them out because this is, this is ground zero of the Rosicrucian um, basically revolution. Uh, uh, Rene Descartes is marching up. Let me take a, my notes here real quick. Um, he's camping and he has a dream. And he says an alchemical angel comes to him and gives him a secret. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. He says, uh, the conquest of nature is to be achieved through measure and number. And sometimes that's all you need. And that was the catalyst and gave us Rene Descartes. That's the philosopher's stone, something that hits you in the soul and causes a catalyst. That's, that, that's really the real philosopher's stone. So again, today, this, this might've been the last place they met before this all happened. So again, I highly recommend you guys visit this. Northern Germany, Lewisenland. Uh, this is where St. Germain, Cagliostro, who are really popular right now, uh, we have Cooper on in a couple of weeks and Unknown Philosophers. Uh, this is where a lot of their stuff went down. They had a tower. The top left, they had three degrees. They had a library. They had an alchemical lab in the basement where they were doing a lot of the exact same things that were in that lead-in text. I tend to think they had a copy of it and also a copy of uh, Paracelsus's, some people say Paracelsus's uh, 1609 opera. They have a grotto. This inspired that place I showed you in Pennsylvania when Rap was a kid, he had probably had access to some of this stuff. Uh, this is the entrance at the bottom left. You can also see their alchemical garden that inspired the one in Pennsylvania. Uh, the color picture, it's a, it's a, I think it's a boarding school today. Those pillars are still there. They're leaning up against a wall. It's wild. Christopher McIntosh and Peter Dawkins are raising money to rebuild this. You can see the construction happening on the right. They've already checked the basement for any alchemical uh, material. It looks like it was empty. These are some of the materials that might have been made there. This is the Holy Trinity Sophia on the left, probably one of the most esoteric texts that uh, you can read. Uh, the one on the right is the Triangle Book. Uh, we have a talisman at the bottom here that we've also recovered that went along with this book. These are things that you can see as well today. Now, the original... Trina Sophia, I believe, is in France. I think it got caught up with everything that ended up in Russia and then was given back to the French lodges because the cup should be emerald, and the one they have is emerald, which is really cool. The uh, House of Heads here in Amsterdam uh, was another meeting place. This is where the Dutch would leave port and connect with the Native Americans in America. And their goal was to create a, a place of freedom. Um, we're still working on it. Uh, this is an incredible place. I had to pause for a second because I, I did a great work in 2012 and I went to Amsterdam and deposited it with Rittman and got to meet with him in his private library. And I highly recommend visit this, visiting this place uh, next time you're in Amsterdam. It's, it's incredible. Okay, well, last stop here. We're back to Pennsylvania. Again, this is called Old Economy. The first place was called Harmony. Uh, it's where the gravesite is. There's no headstones. It's wild. It's got a weird fence around it. It's got a spinning door. There's a lot of mystery. Um, if you want to visit this, the curator is Sarah Buffington. She's wonderful. Uh, her and I have gone hunting. We have found vaults and all kinds of weird things uh, at this place. There was a church built across the street. Here's a real picture from the balcony. And this was the alchemical lab that they were using. I found some letters and read what they were doing. And they were doing the cinnabar path because he was importing crystal cinnabar from China at this time. And I learned what they were doing. And so we walked along the edge here and we looked in the side of the roof. There's a little flap and sure enough were two hidden chimneys. 
and in the roof were some fume hoods. And then if you remove the floorboards, you can see mercury droppings. So this was the alchemical lab where they probably taught as well. Uh, there's a lot of mysteries here. They didn't have children, which is weird. Maybe there was mercury poisoning. And then the building I'm standing on top of is built like a bank. The walls are solid. Uh, so it's an interesting stop. Ask for Sarah. I'll let her know I sent you and then and she can give you a real cool esoteric uh, tour of this place. And last but not least, we have a copy, maybe the copy of the Paracelsus 1609 original opera of his medical works. You can see it here on the right. It's priceless, it's in a safe place. You can ask her to see it. You don't need to wear gloves. There's candle wax on it. John D might have had his hands on this, Kelly, Jermaine, we, we, we don't know. This is amazing. These are some of the other works on the left you might recognize. Interesting thing about the work on Cinnabar when I was working on it was on the crystal structure, there's a symbol, maybe one of the most ancient symbols uh, of, of above and below and those coming together is which we started, started talking about here, the spirit and matter coming together, which is the alchemical process we're aiming for. If you look at the symbol in it, we have an upside down triangle and a right side up triangle within the stone itself. So when Flamel was doing his work, he might have been, when he tried to create a star in his stone, this might have been what he was working on. Again, my brothers and sisters, this is a practical alchemy. If you want to learn more about alchemy, one of the most basic books I have found online that has done a really good job is by Sarah Dern. It's just simple stuff. I love it as it has a feminine touch to it. It has a Sophiac touch. We don't have too many females in the alchemical realm. One of the most famous being Mary the Jewess, who I think gave us the sand bath and may even have termed the word philosopher's stone. If you want to go to the other spectrum of this, if you want to go from purple to red, then you go to India and you can study under a Siddha. If you want to go deeper on a Gori and they will teach you all these processes and, and meditations and alchemical prayers of, of marrying the two uh, together. And that's going to be the, the, <laughs> the, the, the advance. Uh, so this is where you can find some of my work, mysterian.com, blurb.com. I've written a few books. Uh, the Ritman Library in Amsterdam has my work called American Alchemist 2012 on the center of our path, which is also available in some private libraries. We have one at the lodge here. Um, the Mysterian Trilogy is my latest work. It's where I've hidden a bunch of my alchemical works using uh, bacon techniques. It's got three stories that work together, inspired by a uh, book group we had when we were studying the uh, chemical wedding. I want to thank YouTubers, Anonymous, uh, Nerd Rage, Nile Red, and Random Hands for their beautiful, safe laboratory work and being responsible with their chemicals. Uh, also, Steve Kalix video as well. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. And if you guys have a little bit more time, I will go ahead and do a process for you. How does that sound? Is that good? Good on time? Cool. All right, let me take my background off here, guys. Let's see here, let's go to start. Oop, no, we don't want to do that. All right, there we go, there's my background. Okay, everybody hear me okay still? Okay. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with our red stone, which is gonna be copper. I've got a couple of pennies, I've got an older one, I've got a newer one, and I've got a little nugget of copper. And, and, and hopefully this all goes right tonight, we'll see. So far it's been, it's been working out pretty good. So this will be from like the Ripley Scroll. Uh, this is gonna be using zinc, which again, uh, they thought it was a philosopher's stone because of the magical properties on metal. And as we know today, uh, as, a, as a medicine, uh, Basil Valentine, I believe, during the Black Death was, was walking the streets and giving zinc to people and, and killing them, I, healing them much like uh, what it does for COVID uh, today. We're going to need our white powder, which is um, sodium hydroxide or lye. So they'd have to come up with this. That's going to be our white powder. And then our Philosopher's Stone, which is going to be zinc. Now what I do is I've got it in a uh, powdered form here. Now, they might have had it in a crystal form. 
because it would have been collected on the Athenor. Uh, and then we have our water, our blessed water. So the first thing I'm going to need to do is boil this water, and I'm going to use a uh, microwave. Otherwise, it would take a little while. And uh, I just got to remember, guys, to get this really, really super hot. So I'll be right back. All right, well, we're waiting on that. I'm going to get this guy ready here. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to drop the white powder into the water and there would be a code there to step back because it's going to kind of splash. Next I'm going to add the zinc. The zinc is going to create what looks like a stone, a gray stone, a very hot stone. When that copper touches that stone, it will flash to silver immediately. And when they saw this, they probably sharded. That's a good alchemical word, sharded. I'll be right back. Let me get my glove on so I don't burn my hand. How are we looking here? Let's continue to get some more heat, guys. So again, we're starting with a red stone, not crystal cinnabar. We're going to be working with copper. I gotta do this quick. Okay, we're gonna add our white powder. I gotta stand back. Woo! Okay, now we're gonna add our zinc. Okay, we're gonna create our stone. We're gonna let it kind of sit in there for a second and harden. Now we're gonna add our copper. I just heard it. Now, if you could see in there, it's forming a little stone. It's kind of hard on video, guys. But we're gonna let it just sit in there for a minute. That's about long enough. And again, they would, they would have, they would maybe write it in Hebrew or some type of other language that most people wouldn't know, you know, the temperatures that you'd be using here. So I'm going to pour this out. Okay. And let's see what we got. Well, that's kind of a bummer. It didn't work. <laughs> this is supposed to go silver. And then we hit it with heat and then it'll, it'll go gold. I can try it again here. I don't think I had it hot enough. Um, in another presentation we do it, but basically it will go silver and then you, you heat it with some heat. It's kind of hard to do with the microwave. You hit it with some heat and it'll go basically it'll go gold like that and basically all we did was make brass that was it so when they hit it with the heat it would, it would go through all these different colors called the peacock's tail that's where you get that from and then they would drop it into the water and it would go and then it's a really super bright gold color and they didn't know they thought it was gold um, until it started to tarnish so i apologize for that next time we'll I'll use my little uh, actual heater to get it hot enough for you guys. Um, there's a couple videos online of it. You can Google it. A lot of people are doing it in uh, classrooms now, which is really cool. So we'll just kind of leave it there and I'll take any questions that you have. I hope you guys learn um, something about alchemy tonight. I hope I interested you in it as well. Uh, and I'll take any questions, and thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. And, th and I, I'm sorry, guys, the experiment didn't work, but uh, we'll get it better next time. I just got to get that water hotter, but you can Google it. Uh, my goodness, Brother Briggs, that was probably one of the most fun presentations I think I've seen here. Uh, oh, thank you. That was absolutely awesome. Um, you mentioned this was a three-parter, so you are absolutely welcome 
to come do the other two parts whenever the hell you want. So, um, all right. All right. Let's book them. We'll, we'll book them up. Boom. Done. Um, uh, I'll, I'll check Facebook for stuff. Randy, if you want to, um, be the grown up on zoom. All right. Uh, folks, if you have questions here, go ahead. We've got a lot of comments on the chat window. Um, Brother Briggs, I had no idea what I was uh, about to see, and I am blown away. It was phenomenal. Uh, I actually am a chemist, and I would love no, – it's no wonder that people were pointing me towards you before. So now I completely understand. So very, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. I love, I love showing this work, guys. So any of your lodges, I can tie it to Freemasonry, Rosicrucian, if you want a real specific one as well. So uh, I love doing this. and. Again, thank you, uh, Joe, and everybody at Refracted Light for the platform. So uh, and thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. So Lynn has a question. Uh, since you didn't lose any gold, were the other materials as heavy or the same weight as the gold? Yes, it should be. And that's something they would test. I'm sure maybe on a micro level there, there possibly is as well. Um, and I bet you maybe it depends on how pure your, your acids are as well. And again, today we're using, we're using best scenario. That's a great question. Absolutely. And, and that was one of the things they challenged other alchemists. You know, there's a lot of these guys had egos, you know, and they would say, you know, if, if you lose any weight, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so my my comment to that is mass is neither created nor destroyed in the process it is how much of the uh reaction took place to move all of it to the next level if if you come out as a as to briggs point if you come out with a a lesser mass then you've left some in this solution right so so go ahead briggs i'm sorry yes because remember gold is one of the and it might be the heaviest thing on the planet i don't know it's 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 very heavy no okay but it's very but it's very heavy so that gas would have to carry it away so it would have to be lighter than the gas to carry it away but um and i can't believe i'm telling some chemists this but um physics man over here mentioned uh you know you can go from matter to energy and then back from energy to matter so you could lose some in that transfer process um and we can thank albert einstein for that but yeah. yes yeah like that macro level right because i mean at the at the end of the day everything is an electric wave we know that today that's the nice thing about living in in 2020 when we boil down we can see matter now so what you just described is <laughs> we're living in it <laughs> Yeah, no, awesome. This, this incredible, incredible presentation. I loved it. Uh, uh, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. And that's Lee, just touching the surface. Uh, Lee had a uh, question. Can you please post the list of books that you were discussing that we could uh, get a better understanding? Um, Lee, uh, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and post that out to Refracted Light or, or – uh, uh, Briggs, if you don't mind, go ahead and post that out to us and we'll make sure it gets on Refracted Light, uh, either attached to this presentation or as an addendum to it. Great book. Um, uh, Briggs, is, uh, Briggs is on Refracted Light, so he can post whatever he likes. Oh, perfect. Yep, oh, this is a really good one by uh, Timothy Hogan to kind of wet your whistle there. Yep, that's a um, great book. Um, that that's it for i think the questions let me look back up the chat room i think all of us are planning on a, a prog visit here soon i was, was going to add if you want to give us a list as well of all the places we need to go to i think we'll all book a, a big trip <laughs> you got your broadcast live from those places that would be really cool uh, Joe, your question in the chat room was what kind of temperatures are we talking about to boil gold? Oh, I did ask that. Yeah. 
Oh, you mean when we were calcinating the cannabis? Right. That's just freezing temps. That's using... No, um, no, no, no. That's when you were going from, um, when you were actually taking the gold and going from red all the way to black. Like, what temperatures are we talking about there? Oh, I don't remember, man. Um, boiling, basically. Like the boiling temperature of water? Yeah, Randy might know, you know, whatever the boiling point of nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, we can look it up real quick. Whatever that boiling point is, you want to get it to just about right there. It's a balance, right? In chemistry, it's that kind of like that balance of keeping that current heat. That's why they invented the ethanol so they could keep that, that steady heat. That's a great question. Right. So, so, so the, the quick answer to that is, Anybody that wants to invest in that kind or that depth of knowledge needs to pick up the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. Yeah. Um, let's see. The, the question uh, Lee had posted, this was during the change. And that was, uh, so after all of that, meaning the change, is it still pure? The question was, uh, uh, is it still pure? Is the gold still pure? Yes. Yes. Um, so when we go to the red powder, it is, but you, you do have to get that remnants of that acid off of it. Now, Steve Kalick is showing the potable gold uh, where the oil is, is, you know, pulling those, drawing those particles up. Gold is a, gold and mercury are really weird metals, as you know. I mean, they're almost identical. They're just off by that that little video we saw. They do some amazing things. You know, if you've ever uh, some of these guys have worked at Raytheon and Sandia and Los Alamos. I mean, some of the stuff they're doing with these two metals is is, is where alchemy really is today. Um, real miracles. And uh, Brother Briggs, we got quite a few people asking for the other two parts, so we'll definitely get together offline and, and schedule those out. Um, and, uh, Brother Tim was asking if we get a certificate if we attend all three. I am putting those together, yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Yes, we're, we're, we're putting those together. That would be, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So one of my comments and one of the things that I will uh, reiterate is that especially if you're working directly with mercury, be careful on actually touching it with your hands or breathing any, any uh, of the fumes in because mercury uh, has been shown many, many times to be very cancer causing. So um, when you said that about the uh, venting hoods or using a hood in, um, you might, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that to you. What, what is what was the extent of the usage of the hoods? And do you know when that was um, uh, first realized that these people really didn't want to be breathing that stuff? Well, a lot of the cities in India would do it outside. Um, so these guys in Europe were doing it underground, unfortunately. Um, you know, those oxides, the red and the white. <laughs> I was reading in one of, one of the testimonies that the guy's trying to say, if you're on the right path, one of your teeth will fall out. Oof, ouch. Or, or your hair will fall out or your nails will fall out. And he was getting some things confused. But mercury, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is a medicine. As some medicines are very poisonous, but it has to be administered by somebody who, who has that tradition. Now, mercury digesting it at whole isn't too toxic but what happens is if it gets in your stomach it's about 14 times the weight of water and it's just going to cause a hole in your stomach and and now it's not good from there uh do you have any other cautionary tales that you want to uh bring up with with regards to the metals and such i would I, i'm i'm one of those people that um is not afraid to try things as you can see here. Um, I would highly recommend anybody doing any of this stuff because you are working with very toxic things that can cause um, long time damage and especially blindness. That's something I did I, in, in my technology years was invent technology for the visually impaired. Uh, 
So our vision is very important to us. I would work with somebody, talk to me, uh, Timothy Hogan, um, uh, Randy, uh, let's see, Steve Kalick, Burkle. I mean, there's, there's quite a few of us out there. Uh, ask your chemistry teacher, your physics teacher, and, and you'll spark an interest in, with them. They'll just like, Randy, whoa, alchemy, cool, yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about the history of chemistry. <laughs> so thanks for saying that. Yeah, I would, I, I, yeah, definitely. Definitely, um, everything we did today, yeah, and showed um, can have better consequences for sure. Now that said, all of the all of the cautionary tales involved, as long as you're careful and you you think about what you're doing and and you work with somebody like Briggs who has actual direct hands-on experience with this there is a lot of safety involved and there's a lot of uh, cautionary pieces that are probably hidden in those uh, um, uh, paintings and such that I, that I don't recognize, but he would. So understand that the scrolls are inclusive. I'm sure at some point there's, there's cautionary pieces that are involved in the scrolls. Absolutely, and some of the scrolls are traps. Some of the scrolls, they wrote things at the beginning. You wouldn't read the first chapter because if you did what they told you, you probably weren't going to wake up the next day. <laughs> so, Ouch. Yeah, it was, it was brutal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I was going to mention something else, but I forgot what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, questions? More questions? I think that was it on the questions. Everybody is just uh, wanting more of Brother Briggs, so we'll make sure we uh, schedule that up. And I think we're going to go ahead and give uh, Brother Briggs the rest of his evening back since it's still early uh, over in Arizona. So uh, um, I didn't have anything else. Brother Briggs, this was absolutely phenomenal. This was one of my favorite presentations so far. So. Um, Definitely happy to have you back for the other two parts, and uh, we'll get Tim a certificate. And uh, Randy, do you have any other uh, words of wisdom? Thank you so much. This was amazing, truly an amazing uh, presentation. Oh, and uh, because uh, Lynn brought it up, um, so for those of you not on Refracted Light or you got here some other way, uh, we're putting all the presentations on YouTube so that you can share them with your lodges, you can share them with people that are not on Facebook, you can share them with people that are not part of the Refracted Light group. So all of these presentations with the presenter's permission we're putting on YouTube as well, so you can uh, host an event and or learn some more or watch this video 20 more times, which is what I'm gonna do. But um, it's there for everybody to share uh, you know, in this time of darkness. I have one last question. And when you talk about ingesting the red powder or re ingesting the gold when it is in the powdered format and it, it, it's in a salt, essentially it, it has become a salt. Um, what, uh, what was the, um, if you don't mind talk just a little bit about more of the, uh, usages and the uh, longevity factor um, because we touched on that and you did a great job of explaining it but you know what was the usage and how, how did they use it yeah I would suggest um, just everybody do a little research on the health properties of gold it's incredible remember that oil think about what our bodies are made up of remember those particles like a magnet or just flow i mean from an acid right that just destroyed it and it's moving up so imagine if it gets in your blood now it'll attract bacteria and some other things as well um i have tried i've 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 that, that, those two red powders I've never tried. I made the powder. Um, obviously, I've, I've made the Aqua Regia as well, but I didn't try them. I think Steve, K Steve Kalick has. The powder when I made it, it was like a real alchemist. You know, I'm going stage by stage. I'm like, oh, oh look at that. I'm at the next stage. And then, and then when it started, the powder started dropping. Um, I'll use that word again, sharded. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know. And I still have some um, in my little cabinet back here. Um, 
but I would be too afraid to take it. I would come to somebody like you and say, hey, can we get access to a lab and can we clean it and test it for any of those other properties? And if they're not in there, then let's, let's, let's dose it and see what happens. Cool, cool, thanks. Um, another cautionary tale, right? Exactly what you just said. Be very careful of what, just because you made it and it looks good does not necessarily mean that it's, uh, that it's clean, that it's ready to ingest at that point. No, I, I, I'm with you. Um, oh, very cool. No, I, I got to tell you, I, I am I am absolutely blown away. This is was very very cool presentation. Yeah, I'd love to get a group sometime and take you guys to Harmony, Pennsylvania, and show you where the steel industry was started and where Rockefeller got his oil and uh, the presidents that visited there and the German royalty. There's an American history there. Uh, that should be told, and it's a great time for it. It's a wonderful time. And these were Rosicrucians uh, coming to uh, build a new life of, of, of freedom. Brother Joe, I think that's the wrap-up, uh, at least as far as... Perfect way to end it, so I'm going to end the Facebook Live. And... Um... All right, we are done. Um, again, this was brother Briggs. This was phenomenal. I cannot wait to set up the other two with you. So, um, we'll uh, us girls will uh, we'll get together offline and we'll set that up and uh, make everybody happy and uh, uh, have a good evening uh, here on the East Coast. Right. Getting late, so um, again, this was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and again, you're you're on refractive light, so feel free to post uh, whatever you like. Um, for those who don't know, Brother Briggs uh, uh, runs the Unknown Philosophers as well, and he's been uh, sharing his presentations on refractive light as well. So every time I see them, uh, I make sure they get there as well. But uh, like Friday, he's going to have Brother Tim Hogan on. Um, so, and you're live streaming that? Well? Yeah, we're going to have, we're allowing about 30 people in. That's how we're kind of doing it now. You know what the hacking and stuff, we all ran into that. Um, so we're just allowing 30 in. We're clear about that. And then we're going to broadcast it over to Facebook uh, Live. So uh, make sure you follow Unknown Philosophers, their Facebook page, and uh, so you can see more awesome stuff. Um, I think that's it. Uh, if nobody had anything else, uh, love you all. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Don't eat gold um, right away. And uh, love you all. Yeah. God bless, guys. Good night. Thank you so much.